Bezrat Hashem, in a few days, we're going to celebrate Yom Kippur. And we have now 10 days, the 10 days of Tshuva that are a very auspicious time that we really need to take advantage of the right way. Bezrat Hashem, in the next class, we're going to learn a little bit about the month of Tishrei and see how the holidays of Tishrei but it's not a coincidence that all these holidays are packed in into 21 days. Uh, there's one opinion that once asked, why, why isn't it spread out on the year? Why do it so condensed? Rosh Hashanah, right away Yom Kippur, right away Sukkot. So it's actual one long holiday that has a, a process that we have to go through. Mezad Hashem, we're going to learn that in the next class, but just to emphasize that the 10 days of Tshuva, the Aseret Yemei Tshuva, is a process, part of the process of the holiday, from Yom Kippur, from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur. I don't want to ruin the topic or the surprise for the later class, but the teachings of Kabbalah explains that in the 10 days of Aseret Yemei Tshuva, it's the time when we do a rectification for the damage we do for the 10 Sfirot starting that Rosh Hashanah is Malchut and Yom Kippur is Keter. And every day in those 10 days, we do some type of a rectification for some type of damage that was done throughout the year from, the, from our actions to the 10 Sfirot. So the 10 days of Tshuva, Seret Yemei Tshuva, a very, very auspicious time to do Tshuva. We just read over Shabbat, the, the Haftara, the Prophet says, Dirshu Hashem be'imatso, v'kir'u be'oto karov, meaning the, the translation is, you, we have to request to, for Hashem while His presence, while He's very close to us, and, and, and call Him when he, while He's so close to us, hinting on the fact that it's a very auspicious time to do tshuva, that Hashem is listening very carefully for our tshuva, and it's a very auspicious time to do tshuva. And it's one of the most powerful weeks that we have to really concentrate on our tshuva. On Rosh Hashanah, it's not the time to do tshuva. We had a whole entire lul to do tshuva. Rosh Hashanah is the time to accept on ourselves for the coming year. Same thing on Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is the, is the day that we, we are cleansed by the Kadosh Baruch Hu. That's, we're going to talk about it in the third class, about the power of Yom Kippur and what's so special about that day and how it's a, 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 a enabling us to be purified, so to say, to be cleansed by, from all of our bad sins. So we really want to take advantage of these seven days. It says that the seven days of Aseret Yemei Tshuva, because we have two days of Rosh Hashanah and one day of Yom Kippur, the seven days in between, they correspond to the seven days of the week, which means that the first day of Aseret Yemei Tshuva, which was actually, this year was on Saturday, that corresponds to the Sundays of all the year. And then uh, the second day of Aseret Yemei Tshuva, which was this year was Sunday, corresponds to the Mondays of all the, all the year. So we want to take every day of these seven days and really do tshuva. Now, how do we really do tshuva? Besides of all the acts between me and Hashem, there's also a lot of acts between me and another person, which is called Ben Adam Lechavero. We know that Ben Adam Lechavero, Yom Kippur does not atone for those sins. Which means that in these days, it's a suspicious time to go and, and ask for forgiveness, to, to try to, to any argument, chas v'shalom, or fight, to make sure that uh, we, we peace the other side. And uh, even if it's something small, if I maybe hurt somebody, by maybe embarrassing them or hurting them, uh, their, their emotions, or whatever it is. But any type of sin between me and another person, Yom Kippur does not atone for. And therefore it's a very auspicious time to start making phone calls and to all the people that I think that I maybe have caused them any sorrow. 
and it's a good time to go through my phone book and uh, I mean now this is old terms phone book for through my contact list and uh, or my whatsapp list or however whatever list it is and to call people and to wish them a Shana Tova and Metuka and on the way if I hurt you if I did anything then I want to apologize and so forth and needless to say that anything that I didn't do till Rosh Hashanah uh, still to do it if I didn't pay any any debt that I have many people they make a vow throughout the year to give a donation whether it's in the shul or, or, or uh, a charitable organization and uh, with our busy schedule sometimes we forget and, uh, and that's the time to make sure, wait a minute, maybe I, uh, I pledged a donation to a, a, a certain organization or maybe in our shul or whatever it is, this is the time that we really want to make sure that we covering all the grounds Another thing is that this is the time that I should go beyond the normal level that I usually serve Hashem. So if I'm uh, not particular about something throughout the year, this week I should be very particular about. And if, uh, if I'm not so particular, if a man is not so particular to pray in a minyan, then Dafka this week should make the extra effort to pray in a minyan. If I'm not particular with giving charity every day, then this week I should uh, 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 take it to the level that I would wish to be the entire year. And uh, whatever I don't do, a lot, a lot of people say, I don't want to take on myself all these additions, what we call them chumrot. And uh, for many reasons, we're not going to now judge any person's de decision. But many people say, I don't want to take on myself all these extras, whatever they are. So Dafka this week, even though it might sound a little bit hypocritical that well, I'm not doing it all year, I'll do it now, then yes, this is a very auspicious time that even if I don't do it throughout the entire year, to actually do it this week. Whatever it is, and everyone, they use their own imagination. Sometimes it comes in, the, in Kashrut, some people are not so particular about certain things throughout the year. So how we say this week, better to bump it up a little bit. Now, we know that when a mitzvah comes in my way, then I want to be uh, fast and do it right away. What's called zrizim makdimim le mitzvot. A mitzvah, an opportunity for a mitzvah is out there. I should do it right away. So many people already buy their etrog through, throughout this year, uh, throughout this uh, week. The etrog and the four species, because I'm already, I have a mitzvah. Some people already start building their sukkah already in this week because I want to have as many as mitzvot already in my possession before Yom Kippur. Some people, they wait with the building of the sukkah for the night after Yom Kippur, and the second Yom Kippur ends, right away they start building the sukkah. Same thing with buying the trog and the four species. But since it's already an auspicious time to, to do a mitzvah, this is a good time to already buy it and to already do it now and not to do it a day before Sukkot and then I'm remained with all the leftovers and the trogim that are, that are already damaged and touched by a thousand people. If you go to the stores where you buy the trog, everybody picks them up. So this is also a very good time to already do it. I can tell you from my experience when I push it in the previous years when I had to push it for whatever reasons, then it ends up that you're buying it on Erev Chag or the day before with the pressure of doing the sukkah and the meals and this and that. And so now it's a little bit calm. It's a good time to buy already the trog. You can tell your husbands. And uh, the, there, there are four species. Now, <clears throat> a few other things that we need to know throughout uh, the Aseret Yemei Tshuva and then we'll talk a little bit about more about Yom Kippur is that in this week we say Avinu Malkenu and the, the long version, not the short one that we say every day. So again, most people, or I should say more, most women, don't have the habit of really praying Shacharit and Mincha every day. So going to what I said before, that this week you should bump it up a little bit. So you should try this week to make sure that you're praying Shacharit and Mincha and make sure that you're adding the Avinu Malkeno, if, which is the long one, of course. If you have the opportunity, then go to pray in a synagogue where the men are praying. That way when they're saying, Ovinu Malkenu, they're opening the ark. Of course, when they open the ark, 
even though Hashem hears us in everywhere that we scream, but when the ark is open, then Hashem's uh, uh, hearing is more tuned to our prayers. Even though anywhere you'll be in the world, Hashem will listen to you. But it's much more powerful and more auspicious that if you can be in the synagogue while they're reading the Avidu Malkenu, then you'll notice they open the ark. Uh, <clears throat> Next, we have a custom to do throughout this week, what's called Kaparot. And some have the custom to do it, do it with the chicken. I know now in our generation everybody is going uh, oh, crazy with the chickens, don't do it to the chickens, you're hurting the chickens' feelings and, and etc. And we're not going to get into to that uh, argument. One can do it with the chicken, there's no tzar ba'alei chayim to the chicken as long as it, it, you don't hurt the, the animal in a certain way. And most places what they do is even if they use the chicken, they use the, the, the meat to give it to poor people. So either way, you're looking at it, you are participating in the mitzvah. Some people who are particular not to do it with a chicken, then you can do it also with money. But either way, it's a good, uh, it's a good thing to do whether you choose to do it with the chicken or, or not. And it's very important, I mean, I saw in many different communities when it comes to the chickens that that we spoke about it in many different classes, what hurts the, the kashrut of the chicken is, you know, there's a big question in kashrut in, when it comes to how the animal was treated before, prior to being slaughtered. And if the animal, chas v'shalom, was tortured in one way or another, there's a doubt if the animal is kosher to eat after it was slaughtered. One big problem that I see in many places is that based on the teachings of halakha, if a chicken was uh, uh, thrown from a height of a meter and it didn't use its wings to stop the, the, the impact, then that will make the chicken not, not kosher. So if you see, for example, a truck, and I saw it in many places, what they do, they come with the truck to, to the kaparot, and you, you have 16-year-old boys helping to handle the, the truck, and they throw the crates down. So it will not disqualify the chicken from doing kaparot, but there is a chance that it will disqualify the chicken from being kosher to eat. So this is something that, I, I mean, I, in many communities that I went to, it's a big uh, thing. You see the trucks coming, there's a big excitement. Of course, there's the ones on the other side of the road that protest, leave the chickens alone. But again, I'm not going to get into the argument about the chickens or not. I'm just saying that if you're already doing the custom with the chickens and you happen to see how the chickens were handled before that, then you have to be careful that if you are taking the chicken to be slaughtered, some people take the chicken right away to be slaughtered and they take it to themselves. So in previous years, when I, especially when I lived in America, then the place where I used to go, they used to use the chickens to give it to poor people. So, either way, I know in Israel it's not so easy like in America to get the chickens for whatever reason. I mean, it depends where you go. But if you already do that, then make sure that the chicken is not being treated the wrong way, that Chas Shalom later on will be disqualified and be unkosher to eat. Now, if you can, the best way to do it is in the morning of Yom Kippur, which means this year Yom Kippur falls on Friday night and Saturday, and the best way is to do it on Friday around 4 or 5 in the morning, when the sun starts coming up. It's called the Shmoret Abokir. This is the best time to do it. And if you can't, if you're busy, if you're traveling, you can also do it two, three days before that. But that's the most auspicious time to do it. Now, there's many different laws in regards to the kaparot. I'm just going to skip it because I'd rather go more into the Yom Kippur. It's a little bit more important. But if you're already doing it, one, if you're doing it with a chicken, then if a, a male needs to use a male chicken, a female needs to use a female chicken. If a woman is pregnant, then she's, she needs to use three chickens. One for herself and two for the fetus because we don't know if it's a ma male or a female. So sometimes when you go to see Kaparot and you see a woman, uh, the husband, the whole neighborhood is swinging chickens over her head, then you know, I, once I saw 
uh, a lady, she was pregnant with twins, so they swung five chickens over her head, one for her and two for each. Uh, you're smiling. I didn't do that. You didn't do that one? No, I never had twins, so. Oh, okay. So, but once I saw a lady, she was carrying twins, so they had to swing five chickens over the head, one for herself and then two for the, each uh, child, which you don't know if it's a boy or a girl, then you do an extra one. Of course, this becomes already very expensive to be pregnant with twins uh, on, uh, during Kaparot. Of course, you can do it with one chicken for an entire family if you need to. And uh, if you are doing already with the chicken, it's important that the chicken will be slaughtered that, that uh, night. And you also get to do another mitzvah, which is covering the blood with the sand, which that's another part of the tradition that you would stand, see the shochet uh, slaughtering the chicken for the ones who can handle the blood. And then you get to cover the, the blood with, uh, with sand. You say the, the bracha. Of course, if you don't want to do it with the chicken, that's fine. You can do it with money too. And some people will say better to take the money and you just give it to tzedakah. Either way, there is a certain prayer that we read, that it's good to read it, even if you don't do it with the chicken, you can swing, you can hold a bag of money also. Whatever it is, uh, it's... Fish heads too? Some, some do it with fish heads. I mean, the point is that, that it, to read the prayer and to have the kavanah, that one of the many reasons why we do it with chickens and right away we give the chicken to be slaughtered is because for me to have the awareness that I'm, I'm now holding sins and I'm being judged right now and chas I don't know what sins really I have or what tshuva I was able to do and I could be now be, being led to be, to be slaughtered so, so to say so to arouse in the person the, the, the knowledge that wait a minute you know, there, as much as God loves us all, and God is a merciful God, but there is laws, there's rules. And if the Torah comes very uh, clearly to state these rules, Hashem is not joking with anybody. This is not a recommendation. Some people say, oh no, Hashem is so merciful and He's so good, and, and, and He is. But there, then again, the Torah is very clear about the rules. And if the Torah says not to kill, not to steal, not to lie, not to commit adultery, not to do this, not to do that, then that means that there's a, there's a, 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 when there's a law, it means there's also going to be consequences. It's not a recommendation. So, same thing in the, in the law of this world. If the police tells you don't cross a red light, if you will cross a red light, there'll be consequences. Either chas v'shalom, you'll get into an accident. Worse than that, you can kill a person. And uh, on the best uh, scenario, you'll just get a ticket. But when there's a law, there's usually going to be right after that uh, result. Same thing here. We have to take uh, awareness to our actions. Because a lot of people say, oh, you know, Baruch Hashem, I'm a God-fearing Jew. I do what the Torah tells me to do. And Hashem is a good God. Yeah, He is a very good God. But there's also a, what's called a shdin, there's a judge, a, a, a law, and there's dayan, there's a judge. And one could not say, okay, you know, oh, my sins will just evaporate into to the, to the, to the air. No, if I did a sin, I have to have the awareness that I have to do tshuva for that. Of course, Hashem wants me to do tshuva, Hashem is allowing me to do tshuva, and He gives me the option of doing tshuva, but one cannot ignore the fact that I'll just be like, okay, I'll do, I can do whatever I want. Now, we talked about it many different times, that people have this, uh, uh, this thought of, oh, Hashem is, is like a tyrant, and I'll do an action, He will punish me. So, even though, based on the teachings of, of Rambam, Rambam says, yes, there's a concept of sachar ve'onesh, a reward and a punishment. So, punishment sounds like a very harsh word. I like calling it more a reaction. So Hashem is not standing like this in Shammai and saying, okay, punish him, give him one year of torture. Rather, Hashem says, I created the wor world with rules, and uh, these are the rules, and if you break the rules, there's going to be consequences. Like I tell my two-year-old, don't put your finger in the socket because you're going to get electrocuted. And don't uh, cross the street without looking because chas v'shalom, you can get run over. So I might sound very mean to my kids that I don't let them run into the 
street or I don't let them uh, put their finger in the socket or don't uh, touch the, the stove when it's boiling hot, I might come uh, to them in their eyes, I might look like a very mean father. That I don't let them do things. I don't let them eat 17 ice creams. Yes, it's going to cause you a stomach ache. Same thing here. Hashem tells me, don't do this. It's not that he's mean. He's just telling me there's going to be a reaction, a not good reaction. Not too long ago, one of my youngest kids, we, they, they, I came back from America and I brought them like a certain lolly that you can't get it here. And so I bought a lot of them. And one of them, uh, I know from previous uh, experiences, they eat it within 30 seconds. <laughs> they like inhale it. So I said, okay, this time I will keep it. And every couple of days I'll give you one. So I'm not doing it because I'm mean, because uh, I don't want, they don't need to have cavities and stomach aches and whatever it is. So one of my kids took it very personal and he said, you're very mean. You mean you, you brought it already here and you're not giving it to us. So I said, okay, if you think I'm mean, good. So at least you're not gonna have a stomach ache. So uh, sometimes the same idea, we don't understand why Hashem is telling us not to do something or to do something. And not necessarily that Hashem is standing with a rod and hitting us. Rather he says, listen, I created the world with rules. Don't break the rules. If you're gonna break the rules, then there's going to be a consequence and it might hurt. Therefore, when I'm doing the kaparot, is mainly to, to, to remind me where am I holding. Maybe I'm, maybe I didn't do complete tshuva and there's chas v'shalom going to be some type of a consequence or a reaction to my action and that reaction might not be a good one and that should arouse in me to do the right tshuva. Sorry, yes. The, the, I mean, you write that Tashlich and uh, Kaparot is the same idea. But the important thing to remember bo with both of them, we're not giving over the sins to the animal. Happens to be that in Tashlich, what we do in Rosh Hashanah, one of the many, we spoke about it last week in the class about why we do all these things. Uh, one of the many reasons why we Dafka specifically want to have fish there is because a fish is an animal that doesn't close their eyes. And we, we, we say during that time that about Hashem, that he's, he's not going to take a nap and he's not going to sleep. Meaning his eyes are always open looking at us, both for the good and to the bad. So the fish, they just represent the fact that Hashem never sleeps. Like a fish, look at them, they never sleep there, those, those fish. I come here in the middle of the night, they're still, they're still swimming there. My, my, my four-year-old asked me on, during Rosh Hashanah, Abba, when do the fish go to sleep? I said, they don't. They just float there, and their eyes are open, and they really don't sleep. Same thing here, we, Hashem doesn't sleep. And if you're looking at it in a positive way, we're asking Hashem, don't close your eyes for one second, because if chas v'shalom, Hashem will ignore me for one second, I'm in the dark. So I don't want to make a sure about the Tashlech, we actually spoke a lot about it last week, but the, that's one of the many reasons with the fish. Besides that the fish, the Ainara doesn't control them. They, they're, they're the only creature that in the flood didn't get really affected. I mean, of course, there's one opinion that says that even all the fish got affected because the, the hot water was boiling hot. So it cooked uh, gefilte fish, that's why we eat gefilte fish, because uh, the, the fish were boiled in the, in the water. So I'm not joking, the, the, the Midrash says that the water, not only that it came in unbelievable power, like a category 500 hurricane, it wasn't now here, we experience uh, the hurricanes, we get the, the category 5 destroys everything. The Mab Mabul was a category 500, it came in such power, that it just demolished everything in its way. Regardless, the water came from above and it came from below, like a, like a whirlpool, like a jacuzzi. But the water was boiling, boiling hot. So it cooked everything. So I'm joking about the gefilte fish, but that's how they make gefilte fish, no? They put it in boiling hot water and then they boil the, the fish. But uh, the, the evil eye, so to say, the Ainara, doesn't control the fish. So, but again, we don't throw our sin to the animal. Same with the chicken. I don't give my sins to the animal. Rather, 
when, when, when I was young, and they came to our school to teach us a few things. One of them was not to use drugs, of course, and one of them was to drive safe. These are the two things that they constantly came to our school to educate us. And you know, when you see a screen and you see a slideshow, it doesn't affect you. So one time, uh, they took us to a hospital here in Israel, uh, to, it's a rehabilitation center. And they showed us the teenagers that were in car accidents, from drunk driving, from reckless driving. And you saw these beautiful teenagers in wheelchairs without legs. Uh, excuse me, but their whole body was deformed and mutated, like horrible things. And they said, the KC, if you drink and drive, that's what's going to happen to you. And, and the vision of seeing kids my age, I was 15, I was 16, 17, to see the vision of a teenager in a, in a wheelchair or, or in a bed, a, veg, a vegetable. And uh, all, all these, uh, these visions, ooh, that makes you scared. That's how I remember it as a teenager. I remember it very clear that you know, they used to bring us constantly people to talk to us about drugs, about uh, how bad is used drugs. So when somebody comes to the school and just talks to you, okay, it's another lecture. When you go and you see the damage that it does with your own eyes, it scares you. Same thing here, that the effect of seeing something is to shake me. If I see, oh my gosh, now taking an animal here and I'm swinging it, and then I'm taking it to the butcher and he slaughters it and the blood squirts and the animal and I know I'm going to start the, uh, describing the, the vision some people are very sensitive when it comes to that it's to wake you up and say wait a minute this is, uh, this is serious that's the problem with many people not only around Yom Kippur throughout the entire year they, they, turn, they t turn to minimize their actions and the reality, you know, especially I, when I share my near-death experience, one of the messages I give over is don't minimize your actions. Don't think that you do an action and it's just going to disappear from the world. There, a, there comes the day that you have to give an account to your action. Now, of course, I'm talking about the negative ones. The positive ones, they're, they're good. Nothing wrong is going on with the positive. But there's also negative actions. And there's a ripple effect, both on the positive and the negative, but going on to the negative, one should not brush off the actions under the, ta under the rug. And that's what a lot of people do. And they think if I'm going to ignore it or push it or whatever, it will just disappear. That's why many people, they don't deal with problems. They ignore it. And then it becomes worse and worse and worse. And then when it really is time to deal with it, it was neglected for 20 years, now go deal with a problem that was neglected for 20 years. So these little actions, these uh, uh, traditions that we do, it's uh, yeah, like a wake-up call. It's more like for me to like, wait a minute, this is, uh, this is not a joke. If I lie now, the, this, is, this is against the universal rules of, of the Torah, there's going to be an issue here. Because when Hashem created the world, he created the world with rules. That's how Hashem created, and He's not breaking the rules. You can see throughout the last 5,778 years, Hashem never broke the rules. He may be uh, twisted how the creation is, but He never changed the creation. Even in the plagues of Egypt, He didn't create a new creation. He took whatever exists in creation, and He magnified it. So, instead of having one frog, so there's a million, a million frogs. Instead of having, a, a, you know, three street dogs walking in the street, so now there's 5,000 animals walking in the street. He didn't create a new reality. He took what is created in the universe and changed it, magnified it, or, or made it extreme. Same thing with the splitting on the ocean. He didn't change a creation. He just moved the water. So... And we see that throughout the entire history. Hashem made many, many miracles, but He didn't invent something new. Whatever was created in the six days of creation, that's it. That's the rules. When we read the book of Bereshit, we see a form, a process of creation. The sun, the moon, the trees, the animals, the fish. 
But if you're looking at the, the, the inner explanation, that's when Hashem laid down the rules. These are the rules of the world, and I'm never changing them, and I'm never going to break them, and Hashem doesn't change or break the rules. So, same way in our terminology, in a, a country there will be laws, in you buy an electronic device, there's a rules to it, you can put it in water, you can expose it to heat, you can do this, you can do that. So Hashem created the world with many rules, and there's reasons for the rules. And then He gave us a guide. He says, here's the Torah, follow the rules. If you do the positive things, it will benefit you. You'll do the negative things, it can hurt you. Don't, don't, uh, don't uh, ignore my rules. And again, it's not that Hashem is now on the, uh, is a terrorist, chas v'shalom, and He wants to terrorize us. He just says, these are the rules, don't do it, don't lie. When you lie, you're breaking the universal code of the Torah. You're creating a, a problem. When you cheat, when you slander, when you curse, not you, I'm just saying, when we do all these things, some of the things, they make sense to us. Take a normal human being, he'll say, okay, I understand, stealing is not a good thing to do. Some people, for them, stealing is a total normal thing. Some cultures, killing, it's a total normal thing to kill in their culture. So we don't go by what, co what common sense goes, we go by what the Torah says. Some things make sense to me, not to kill, not to commit adultery, not to steal. Some things don't make sense to me, to eat meat and dairy now, separate the meat and the dairy, it doesn't make sense, it's food. Or many other things, not to drive on Shabbat, not to do this, not to do that. So we have to follow the rules of the Torah and to understand Hashem means business. This is not a, this is not a joke, this is not a, a recommendation and after 120 years when I go up to Shemayim they said, oh, I really mean we were joking, <laughs> we didn't really mean it. So if the Torah comes clearly to say, then I have to follow it. And all these rituals and all these traditions is to come and to explain to me, listen, this is a, don't, don't uh, 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 minimize these things. Don't think that if you're going to do something, it will just disappear to the, to, out of the universe. You did an action, then okay, no, 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 nobody's killing you. Do tshuva, make, make a rectification, and, and, and follow the rules. So, the entire 10 days of a Seret Emei Tshuva, and Rosh Hashanah, and Yom Kippur, is to bring the person not to fear that Hashem now is going to barbecue me because I did something. That's not the point of this entire 21 days. It's for me to understand, okay, I did something wrong. How am I fixing it and where am I changing myself? The whole point here is to make me a better person. Hashem didn't bring me to the world to take me on a, on a roller coaster and then to, 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 to torture me. That's not the, the, the meaning of the, this life. Shem says, I want to refine you. How am I going to refine you? First, you have to understand what it means to do something wrong. That's why Hashem even gives us the option of sinning. If Hashem did not want us to sin, He wouldn't even give the option of sinning. He wouldn't even give the option of tshuva. You know, tshuva is one of the 613 mitzvot in the Torah. Meaning that Hashem already intended us to sin if He already created the option of tshuva. So Hashem says, in order for me to refine you, I, you need to get dirty a little bit. You need to feel it. You need to experience it. Then you can refine yourself. I can only testify about myself and probably about a couple other thousands that I met. You only refine yourself after you get yourself dirty with an with a unwanted act. You can't say, okay, you know what? I'm going to from tomorrow change my 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 character trait yeah but first you have to experience why you want to change it if i have a problem with anger and this is one thing we're going to talk about in the next class that most of the tshuva we have to do in yom kippur is not necessarily about my sins it's about my midot it's my character traits it's my 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 behavior it's not necessarily for the fact if i mix the dairy or the meat or if i turn the light on on shabbat that i have to do tshuva regardless but i have to do tshuva for my midot so let's say, my midot is my character traits. Let's say I have a problem with anger. And I react very quick. And every person that gets me upset, I scream at them. And, and I raise my voice. And I lose my temper because of that. And I break things and so forth. And that's something common. We all have a, t a temper. And we lose our temper. So why, why do I have this character trait? Why does this happen? Because Hashem says, I want you to refine yourself. 
in the character trait of anger. So you will be more relaxed. How can you refine yourself if you don't know what it means to be angry? You have to experience it one time, two times, three, four, five. You have to see the damage it causes. You have to see how it's affecting the people around you to realize, oh my gosh, I have to control my anger. It's hurting my wife, it's hurting my kids, it's hurting my, my neighbor. So in order for me to refine myself, I need to experience the negative part of it. So Hashem takes us, so to say, on a, on a ride and says, I want you to experience some negative things because that's where you're going to be able to find the tools how to refine yourself. So all these acts that we do is to remind me where I'm holding, what, what I'm supposed to do. And regardless of that, the entire process of the tshuva, this month is a very auspicious month because spiritually on the positive side, I take all this energy. This month has very, very powerful energy. It's like going now to a supermarket and I buy a lot of products. What, what is the action I'm doing there? I'm taking now from the supermarket all these products that will allow me to eat, to drink, to enjoy these things. So the month of Tishrei is I'm going to the supermarket. I'm gathering all this energy from the entire month that will sustain throughout the entire year that all these, these things that I need to work on throughout the year, that's the time when I actually now start digging and I'm taking, taking to, to carry with me for the rest of the year. So the point of tshuva is for me to have the awareness that I do something wrong is right away to fix it, not to neglect it. And this is not only with my actions in front of me and Hashem, it's my actions between me and, and other people. If I know, I keep saying it in so many different lectures, if I do tshuva every day on Kirat Shema Lamita, I don't need to do tshuva on Yom Kippur, because I already did tshuva every day of the year. I don't owe somebody money, I don't, didn't hurt anybody. If I did something wrong, we're all human. We're all human, we're all going to do things that are not 100%. So Hashem says, do tshuva right on the spot. Why wait? Why schlep it till Yom Kippur? You think I can remember now what I did 11 months ago? I don't remember what I did last week. How can I remember what I did 10 months ago to do tshuva over on that? So the right way is to do tshuva every day. When I say Kriyat Shema Lamita, you sit five minutes and you review your day. And the next day you fix it. Same thing on Erev Shabbat on Friday night, you do tshuva. On Rosh Chodesh you do tshuva. Comes Yom Kippur, I don't need to do much. I need to do mainly tshuva for my midot. And mainly my tshuva is where do I want to refine myself? I know how I was this year, it's not now to get smacked now, to say, okay, this year I wasn't so great with learning Torah, next year I want to refine myself. This year I was not so particular about Kashrut, next year I want to bump it up a little bit. The point is how am I growing and not to look at the, at the trail that I'm leaving behind. So we got to take these 10 days uh, seriously. Let's do a few more things that we want to... Uh, uh, concentrate on on Yom Kippur you know we might have to do that maybe on Thursday and then we can do Thursday another class about all the laws of Yom Kippur because there's a lot there's a lot of things that we need to know of on Yom Kippur what to do and what not to do State uh, excuse me State this is a this is a, a, a how would you call it a, like uh, <laughs> uh, a, a lot of laws of Shulchan Aruch uh, collected into one little uh, uh, concentration of specific laws specifically for holidays. So instead of opening our Shulchan Aruch and going through all the laws, this is a, a dessert. It's uh, concentrated all the laws for different holidays that are more uh, applicable to us, things to practically do. Because there's so many things to do, that, or even on Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is like Yom Shabbat. You can't work, you can't uh, take a shower, you can't uh, uh, drive, you can't eat. You, many things, but a lot of people think, okay, Yom Kippur is just not eating. There's a lot of other things you're not allowed to do. You're not allowed to wash your hands with water, you're not allowed to your body with water. You can't rub any oils on your body, all sorts of different things. So different laws that we need to know. When is the holiday coming? When is it ending? What do I do in the beginning? What do, how, how do I have to do the, the breaking of the fast, the eating of the fast? There's many different things that we need to know and that we want to take to consideration and to do them and not to come, you know, for example, this Rosh Hashanah, 
it was uh, Wednesday, Thursday, which goes into Friday, of course, and then it's attached to, to Shabbat. So in a situation like this, we have to do something that is called Eruv uh, Tavshilim, that I can uh, cook on Friday for Shabbat. And, uh, you know, we learned about it a few days before that, and on Wednesday, you know, I was telling all the people, don't forget the Ruf Tavshilin, and of course, Friday morning, you know how many women came to me, I forgot to do Ruf Tavshilin, can I cook? So, no, you're going to have a problem now to cook, you have to cook very early, you have to cook and eat it right away, and then eat some of it for now, and not for Shabbat, and then of course you have to count on the Ruf Tavshilin of the Rav of the city, and it causes a problem. So there's many different things that you need to know and not to say, oh, I forgot. <laughs> so this is a summary, that's the word, a summary of all the good, the, the important laws that are practical that we need to follow. So I wanted to go through uh, everything till Yom Kippur, but uh, there's too many. I think what we'll do is we'll just do another class on Thursday for these laws and which will give us enough time to prepare for Yom, for Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is this Friday, Bezrat Hashem. And in the meantime, since we're still in the Seret Yamei Tshuva, then we need to concentrate on whatever we need to do in regards to Tshuva in the Seret Yamei Tshuva. And I can tell you in a very quick summary of, of that we want to take advantage of in this day is mainly the things between me and another person. Because really, that's what doesn't get uh, atoned on Yom Kippur. Shem says, I'll forgive you for everything that you did, besides things that you did between the Ben Adam Lechavero, between me and another person. There is another group of sins that Yom Kippur doesn't help, and these are all the sins that, are fall, that fall under the category of what's called Mita Bidei Shamaim, death by the heavenly court, and all the sins of Karet. Th this Yom Kippur doesn't help for that. And uh, the Talmud explains that these specific sins, what Yom Kippur does, it puts the sin on hold. Which means, to quickly explain, there are three types of sins. There are sins that are, that are it's a, was a positive commandment that I didn't do. I'm supposed to put fill in, I have to say Birkat Amazon, I have to, 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 to do all sorts of things. Then these are positive mitzvot, and they're positive not because they're positive to do, rather because it's uh, uh, I have to do it. It's an action that I have to do. If I didn't do that, then that's, that's going over a mitzvah to say. So for that, a person just needs to do tshuva, and, uh, and that's it. Which seems like it's much easier to do. Because the Talmud says, Oset tshuva, and you know, lo zazat shenimchalo. Just uh, says, okay, I... I forgot, I do tshuva, and then he gets forgiven. Then there's another group of sins that are all the mitzvot lotase, all the negative uh, precepts. Not to mix meat and dairy, not to mix wool and linen, not to all the not tos. And if I do any of these sins, of the negative ones, then I have to do tshuva. And it says, tshuva tola, it puts the sin on hold. The Yom Kippur mechaper, and Yom Kippur atones for that, washes that. So all these sins that are falling under the category of the precepts, of the lota say, as long as I did tshuva, Yom Kippur just comes and washes all it off. But all the mitzvot that are karet, which we have 36 mitz uh, uh, sins of karet, two are positive, circumcision and the, the, the sacrifice of Pesach, and 34 that are negative. The ones that have to do with us is Shabbat, anything that has to do with Shabbat, uh, eating and, and working on Yom Kippur, Chametz on Pesach, all the forbidden relations. And these are the things that are connected to us because the rest has to do with eating parts of the sacrifices in the Bet HaMikdash, doing things like a seance and so forth. These specific sins, Yom Kippur doesn't do anything. What it says, Yom Kippur Tshuva ve Yom Kippur Tole, the Tshuva and Yom Kippur puts the sin on hold, means that I, there's no judge, judgment right now. Then the person has to go through what's called a hardship in order to wash the, the stain off. We spoke about it, I spoke a few days ago with somebody and we talked about the, the character trait that some people have that they can't stand it when something makes their clothes dirty. And many people have it. 
I was like that. I was fanatic about the clothes. If something like a little microscopic uh, dirt, you know, I, would, I, I couldn't sit comfortable if it, it was like a little stain on my, my clothes. My clothes were like my uh, idol worship to my clothes. All the clothes had to be perfectly cleaned and ironed and if there was a little dirt and, and, uh, and that's how, how I was. Many people are like that, which it's normal to look clean and organized, but when it's too much, that's already a problem. So, and then of course I got married and, uh, you know, with marriage things change and then started coming kids. So kid, kids get you very dirty. And in the beginning, I couldn't take with the babies, you know, they're making me all dirty and I had all these stains and everything, especially I'm wearing black. And every kid, I relax a megaton, you know, so, so now all my clothes are dirty. And like, you have dirt here, yeah, I know, yeah, I know, it's, so, so, <laughs> I spoke with somebody not too long ago that has had the same thing with the dirt on the clothes. And, and even funny, yesterday my parents came to visit us. And, and, you know, Baruch Hashem, I have a two-year-old, a four-year-old, a six-year-old, and they come to you with the, with the ice cream and the this and the then and the, it's like food everywhere. So my mom told me, your, your shirt is dirty. I'm like, I know, I, said, like, I know, <laughs> we'll wash it. So, <laughs> so my mom was laughing how I'm like, yeah, I know, your pants are dirty, I know. <laughs> so, so, Baruch Hashem, you, you know, the, the sins that we do, they put stains on our neshama. And it's not go, it doesn't go on the neshama, on the soul. It goes on the garments. Our soul is so holy. It cannot even interact in this world without a garment. This is where it manifests into the world. Because originally Adam and Chava, Adam and Eve, they were naked. Now, the, the, people think it was like these two adults walking in the botanical gardens naked and eating apples. This is not the idea. Naked, they, they were so holy. They didn't need a body and they didn't need garments. Their neshama was pure. So this is how the souls are in Gan Eden. In Gan Eden and Yon, they don't need levushim, they don't need garments. They're, they're pure neshamot. Since they went down in their level, then they need a garment to cover the neshama in order for the soul to interact with the universe. In the world above, they don't need that. Souls don't talk. When I share my near-death experience, people tell me, how does the voice of Hashem sound? How do, how do you talk with the other souls? How do the other souls look like? So you, there's, no, there's, there's not even that terminology in the world above. Voices, the souls they communicate in, I mean, we can call it mental telepathy. But the souls communicate in such an advanced way of communication that we will never understand how a soul communicates. Even if you compare it to technology and you say, how do my phones communicate? I mean, all day long, we communicate through phones. How do, they, how do the phones communicate? You know, I always make a, a joke of all the people, they're sending all these smileys everywhere. Every, every conversation in text, it's smileys. Just imagine how many, no, not smileys, how do you call them, emoji, mojos, emoji? Just imagine how many emojis are flying in the universe from side to side, billions and billions of these emojis somewhere in the world of telecommunication. Where are these emojis? And, 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 you know, computers communicate all along with each other. You, you don't, we don't even realize that you go to a store, you run the credit card, there's a computer now that is com contacting another computer to ask the other computer, if they can charge your card for that amount, if there's credit, if there's enough money there, the computers are communicating. In the olden days, it's like as if somebody would call the bank, is the check has cover? Now the computer is talking, and this is all in a fraction of a second. So there's different types of communications, so much more so, what is the communication between a soul to a soul? Since the souls are in a much lower level, they have to be dressed into garments in order to interact. So these garments, they get dirty by our actions. I now lie and I cheat and whatever I do, I, I steal. The stain goes on the, on the garment. And we don't notice it now, but the soul notices when it goes to the world above. It sees the stains. 
the stains everywhere. And Yom Kippur is the day that washes these stains. But it does not wash the stains that it's between me and another person. And it does not wash the stains of these severe sins of Karet and Mitah Bidei Shamayim. And for that, the person has to go through hardship because the hardship washes off the stain. The reason why I gave you the example of me getting upset with all the dirt, because sometimes you have a little bit of dirt, you take a towel, and a, a wet towel, and you will brush it off. Sometimes it doesn't work out. You have to take it to the dry cleaning. The dry cleaning steams it with boiling hot steam. Then it brings it back to you. You look and you say, no, I'm sorry, the stain is still here. Okay, give it back. They steam it again. So, no, I'm sorry, the stain is still here. Sometimes you can't get rid of the stains. Yom Kippur is the dry cleaner, the day of the dry, the, day, the yearly dry cleaner. So the more preparation that I do throughout the, the, the 10 days, the more the dry cleaner will be successful. And I have to remember that the day doesn't wash the sins between me and another person. So this is the time to concentrate and to going to appease every person. And I know of course comes the big, the big question, there's a certain person in my life, they're, we, they're very upset at me. I tried to apologize already 50 times, they're not accepting my apology, and they're still upset at me. And if you did your, your real effort, not fake effort, if you really did an effort, and that person is still not forgiving you, that's the problem. You, have to, you are obligated to try three times, but to seriously try, not to send a box of chocolates, to really try to, 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 to appease the person. So we got to concentrate mainly between Adam and Chavero. And on the day of Yom Kippur is to mainly to take on myself what am I not change? What am I going to change in the world, in, in, in my life, in the coming year, based on what I failed the year before? This is the account that I need to do. If I failed in this department, I wasn't so particular with kosher, then next year I'm going to be very particular with kosher. I wasn't particular with learning Torah or, or uh, guarding my mouth or whatever it is, then to, to see, that's kind of again one of the things with, the, with all these uh, rituals, is for me to understand, wait a minute, I did something wrong the entire year. It's almost like, you know what, on a, on a very personal note, I go every month or two, I go on a tour. And I just came back now from uh, a roller coaster in, in the United States. So every time that I go, then I don't like going on these tours. It's far away, I'm not in my home, my kids miss me, I miss them, I'm not comfortable, I don't like these tours. But I, you know, Hashem is not consulting what I want, if I want to do it, I don't want to do it. But the good thing is always I, I miss my wife a lot, and I miss my kids a lot, and I miss my, my surrounding, my bed, my, my corner. So it makes me do a very good cheshbon nefesh to understand to appreciate these little things. And that's when I realized, you know what, I need to spend more time with, with this child. And I need to learn more Torah with that child. And it makes me understand these little things that I would never come to understand that throughout the year. Baruch Hashem, I'm busy. And not always I have time for all of my six kids. Some kids need more attention. Some kids need a certain type of attention. And same with my wife, and same with many different things. This is when, I, when I'm away from it, that's when I realize, you know, this specific child, I need to take him more to show with me. That specific child, I need to learn more Torah. This kid just needs me to play with him an extra 10 minutes every day. <clears throat> so when do I realize that? When I'm far away, when I miss them. And when I come back, I always say, okay, I have a list of these hachlatot, these decisions. And usually I, I see it lasts good for two, three months. I'm all excited and then, you know, life wears off and you start forgetting all these things unless it's uh, pinned to your fridge. So this is again, all these three weeks and especially the, the 10 days of tshuva, it's for me to realize what did I not do the entire year? What, what, if I didn't do it, if, I, if, I, if you want to categorize it or title it as a sin, what didn't I do the entire year? Why is Hashem putting that in front of my face? Hashem allows me to sin. If Hashem doesn't want me to sin, there's not going to be a Yetzer Hara, I'm not going to sin. I know it sounds like a contradiction, but Hashem is the one who allows me to sin. 
Because if not, Hashem will say to the Yetzirah, stop, don't, don't, don't do anything, and then there's not going to be Yetzirah. I will do it without any problem. Hashem allows me to sin because He wants me, first of all, He wants to see the, the, the fight, to see if I'm going to run to do the sin or if I'm going to decide not to, and of course to do tshuva. So in order for me, we told you, in order for me to, to, to fix, I have to break first. And Hashem wants us to, to refine. It means I have to damage something in order to refine it. My daughter just went to some interesting place where they make a pottery. And, and you look at the vase or whatever it is, it's beautiful. But you didn't see how it looked in the beginning, like a, a piece of mud. Then you have to break it into pieces and start processing it. Same idea. So what I want to concentrate in the next couple of days till the end of a Aseret Yemei Tshuvah is like I told you, the seven days between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, they correspond to every day of the, year, of the, of the week throughout the year. And, and if you want to look at it in the Kabbalistic terms, then the seven days they correspond to the seven Midot, that every day I have to work on one Midah. We'll talk about it in the next class, how the ten days... Excuse me? Which Midah to start with? Which? Midah to start with. Well, you start with Rosh Hashanah is Mahot. And then the next day of Rosh Hashanah is going to be already Yesod. And then Tzom Gedalia, which this year was pushed, will already be, it will be a, a Hod. And, and so forth. Yom Kippur is, is Ketel. So we have a lot what to do. Bezrat Hashem, this should be the last Yom Kippur that we need to really work on ourselves. Bezrat Hashem, Mashiach is going to come very soon. We're not going to... We're not going to have to struggle with sins anymore. We're just going to do a tov b'ene Hashem. But b'emet, Bezrat Hashem, we should take uh, this 10 days seriously to, to get our act together, to really focus on what we need to do. Hashem has high expectations from us. And it's a very auspicious time. It's not a good time to just let it go and to wake up the, the minute before and say, oops. So we had 30 days of Elul. There was so much going on and many people... The day before, oh my gosh, it's the day before Rosh Hashanah, I didn't do anything. So we don't, we don't want to let the opportunity go, we want to take advantage of everything. It's a very auspicious time when Hashem is very close to us, when Hashem is accepting our tshuva. And we have to invest in this time, in this week, to see, A, what did I do wrong that I can do my tshuva, to rectify it. And what do I, what, what do I want to, how do I want to pave my coming year? Where do I want to get better? And there's no better way of doing it like Esther is doing is to take a notebook and to write things down. Where do I want to, because if I do it based on my memory after a day, it disappears. I like writing things down. Like you go to the, to the supermarket to, to shopping, if you don't have a list, you forget a bunch of things. Oof, I forgot this and I forgot that. Rather to write it down, you don't forget nothing. And I like writing things down. I want to add this year another hour of learning Torah. I want to make more uh, uh, awareness about how I talk to other people and so forth. Just throwing some examples. So Bezad Hashem, Hashem will accept our tshuva and grant us a beautiful, successful, happy, healthy year.